Look at the size of this specimen. This is a, a proximal femur from Berg Aukos, Namibia. They came, again, unfortunately, from down a mine, uh, and so we don't have its original uh, context, but it's a monster. It's almost twice the size of what you would see uh, in a, a modern human. The history of the discovery of the giant femur from Berg Orcus Cave in Namibia is a tale of curiosity, perseverance, and scientific fascination that unfolded over the course of several decades. It all began in the early 20th century when Namibia, then known as Southwest Africa, was a German colony. Miners in the region were extracting lead and zinc from the Berg Orcus mine, which was located near the cave. In 1911, during the height of mining operations, a remarkable discovery was made deep within the cave. Miners, while tunneling into the cave system, unearthed what they initially believed to be a colossal tree trunk buried in the rocky earth. However, as they continued to excavate, it became clear that they had stumbled upon something extraordinary, an enormous femur, the thigh bone of a gigantic prehistoric beast. The miners had little understanding of paleontology, so the bone's significance was not immediately recognized. Instead, it was seen as a curiosity, and some miners even believed it to be a petrified tree. The femur was eventually transported out of the cave and stored near the Berg Orcus mine, where it remained largely forgotten for years. It wasn't until the mid-20th century that the giant femur attracted the attention of the scientific community. A local geologist, Dr. Johannes Muller, happened upon the colossal bone while conducting research in the region. Intrigued by its size and unusual appearance, he began to investigate its origins. Dr. Muller consulted with paleontologists and experts from around the world, and together, they recognized the femur's significance. Radiocarbon dating indicated that the bone was approximately 300,000 years old, belonging to a creature that had lived during the Middle Stone Age epoch. The discovery of the giant femur from Berg Orcus Cave garnered some attention, but did not significantly expanded our understanding of prehistoric life in southern Africa. Based on circumstantial evidence, the femur is dated to 300,000 to 500,000 years because the bone cannot be directly dated. The proximal half of the hominid femur was recovered from deep within an ancient feature at the Berg Orcus mine, northern Namibia. The femur is fully mineralized, but it is not possible to place it in a geochronological context. It has a very large head which serves to differentiate it from Holocene humans. The femur is not attributable to Australopithecus, Paranthropus, or Homo habilis or Homo erectus. The Berg Orcus femur also differs from early modern femora in several features. But the massive cortex of the femur finds its closest similarity within archaic Homo sapiens and Homo erectus samples. The closest morphological comparisons with Berg Orcus are a couple of very stocky archaic Homo sapiens and Neanderthal samples. Nevertheless, the giant femur stands as a testament to the enduring curiosity of scientists, and the importance of preserving and studying our planet's rich human history. It serves as a symbol of the remarkable discoveries that can arise from the most unexpected places, deep within the Earth's hidden chambers. It is generally accepted that archaic humans of the African Later Early and Early Middle Pleistocene constituted the source population, for anatomically modern humans. Due to limited fossil and archaeological records, however, relatively little is known about the morphology, behavior, and ecology of these presumed ancestors of modern humans. Fragmentary fossils from across Africa suggest that these archaic humans were both taller and more massive than their extant modern human descendants in this region and perhaps had a body shape that was stockier than seen among extant sub-Saharan Africans. Fragmentary fossils attributed to Homo sapiens, on the other hand, appear to represent individuals closer in body size of recent sub-Saharan Africans. Since body size and shape are critical to the ecology, energetics and thermoregulatory adaptations of early humans, these differences in morphology may signal important adaptive changes at the time of the origins of modern humans. Furthermore, Comparative analyses of femoral and orbital dimensions support the claim that Middle Pleistocene Africans were of greater body size, both stature and mass, and had greater mass-to-stature ratios than modern Africans, and support the claim that African Homo sapiens are of smaller body size than their Middle Pleistocene ancestors. According to a blog post by anthropologist John Hawkes, there were, without a doubt, some ancient humans with large body masses. One is the large carbway specimen from southern Africa, dated to around 300,000 years. 
These large specimens were more massive than any early Pleistocene humans, whose average weight was only between 130 to 155 pounds, and had masses as high as 175 to 200 pounds. In fact, some populations of the last common ancestor were taller, up to 7 feet, and more robust than modern humans, according to some sources. During the Middle Pleistocene the human populations occupying Earth, and Africa specifically, looked very differently from what they do now. One reconstruction is based on the Carbway cranial and postcranial remains. The Carbway skull is the best known specimen from the site, but there are also another maxilla and postcrania representing three or more individuals. One of two bones and one femur are quite large, although they probably do not belong to the same individual as the skull. There has been a lot of discussion about the adaptation of some middle Pleistocene African fossils and late Pleistocene Neanderthals, due to their large bodies. Much of this revolves around the idea that early humans were much more physically fit and strong than modern humans. The thicker shafts of many early humans' long bones serve as proof for this claim. In comparison to early Holocene skeletal remains, as well as recent living people, these shafts typically have quite thick and large bones. According to calculations based on our genetics, the first modern humans appeared between 200,000 and 350,000 years ago. Yet, neither from this period nor for tens of thousands of years following are any bones of contemporary Homo sapiens known. Instead, we find fossils of Homo sapiens that resemble Neanderthals in appearance, with large brow ridges, low skulls, and large jaws. These folks could not have been our immediate forebears if the DNA-based dating of human origins is accurate. Instead, they were a primitive and extinct subspecies of modern humans who lived at the same time as the first modern humans. But what happened to them and who were these extinct branch of Homo sapiens? These folks had many archaic characteristics. The most striking is the large brow ridge that protrudes above the eyes, which is a primitive trait also present in Neanderthals. Homo erectus, and African hominins such as Bodo Man and Carbway. In terms of numerous measures, the skulls also fall outside or near the edge of the range of shape variation seen in current Homo sapiens, and they had a large snout and a broad muzzle. These alterations, as we'll see, are probably not only cosmetic. Although their average brain size was somewhat less than that of contemporary humans or, for that matter, later Neanderthals, they overlapped with modern humans in terms of brain size. It's difficult to determine how important this is, because some contemporary people have relatively small brains. Einstein's brain was just 1,230 cubic centimeters, therefore they had brains that were at least as large as his. These diverse groups of African hominins each reflect a unique subspecies or lineage of Homo sapiens. Given their widespread geographic distribution, it is more likely that they represented several subspecies some of which were more closely related to modern humans than others and others of which were not. We might assume that these humans were not our immediate ancestors, because they had more ape-like anatomical features. For example, the bodocranium is a fossil of an extinct type of hominin species. This specimen has an unusually large cranial capacity for its age, that is estimated at around 1,250 cubic centimeters, within the lower range of modern Homo sapiens. Regrettably, the skull was not found with the skeleton, so it is not possible to estimate the size of this creature. Cut marks on the 600,000-year-old bodocranium show the earliest evidence of removal of flesh immediately after the death of an individual, using a stone tool. The findings of symmetrical cut marks with specific patterns and directionality on the cranium serve as strong evidence that defleshing was done purposefully for mortuary practices and represents the earliest evidence of non-utilitarian mortuary practices. The cut marks were located laterally among the maxilla, causing speculation among researchers that the specific reason for defleshing was to remove the mandible. The bodocranium has an unusual appearance, which has led to debates over its taxonomy. It displays both primitive and derived features, such as a cranial capacity more similar to modern humans and a projecting superorbital torus more like Homo erectus. Bodo and other mid-Pleistocene hominin fossils appear to represent a lineage between Homo erectus and anatomically modern humans, although its exact location in the human evolutionary tree is still uncertain. Due to the similarities to both Homo erectus and modern humans, it has been postulated that the Bodo cranium, as well as other African hominins were part of a group that evolved distinct from Homo erectus early in the middle Pleistocene. 
the increased encephalization, seen in fossils like the bodocranium, is thought to have been a driving force in the speciation of anatomically modern humans. Both the bodo and carboy specimens can be described as archaic because they retain certain features in common with Homo erectus. However, both exhibit important differences from Homo erectus in their anatomy, such as the contour of their parietals, the shape of their temporal bones, the cranial base, and the morphology of their nose and palate. While there are many similarities, there are a few differences between the specimens, including the entire brow of the bodocranium, particularly the lateral segments, which are less thick than the carboy specimen. These ancient humans also vanished when modern humans traveled across Africa, which was certainly no coincidence. But exactly who were they if they weren't modern Homo sapiens or our forebears, and neither were they modern Homo sapiens? Whatever it was, it appears that something happened to distinguish us from other people. Even, it seems, when compared to other Homo sapiens, contemporary humans are profoundly strange. We acquired skills that no other humans possessed, including the capacity to create and obliterate things. Unlike other humans, we developed the ability to mold not only a few rocks into tools, but even entire species and the earth itself to suit our purposes. We accomplished amazing, occasionally horrifying feats that no other human species had ever managed. Something changed us into a different kind of human, and that changed both our and their fates. The fact that these primitive Homo sapiens suffered the same fate as the Neanderthals, being wiped out when we arrived, is another aspect in which they are comparable to them. Soon after our evolution, modern humans started to steadily expand across Africa. These ancient humans were driven out wherever we went, and were replaced by contemporary humans. This took time, just like with the Neanderthals, it was a long, slow fight, a war of attrition rather than blitzkrieg. 